Then, yeah, just wear the beanie. That's it. That's pretty solid. I feel good about that. That's a good way to start this. Get the attitude up high, you know. Go trade two J's if you could become Wolverine. Where are you getting all this information? I definitely heard some some rumors about it. Are you still going? For, I, I can't get goosebumps thinking about it because it's like you can hear them get the car. I was going to qualify and I was going to drive it out the racetrack. Just threw the hood over the ditch and longest employee of Knox. You did some digging there, huh? Look, we all enjoy wearing FD merch. I know I do. If I am not wearing a completely black outfit, minus this hat that has about 100 different names for the color, teal, seafoam, whatever you want to call it. But when I'm not wearing this, what do I got on? FD merch, of course. So head over to shopfd.com. Use the coupon code PODCAST24, just the numbers. Don't spell it all out. Save yourself 20%. So that is shopfd.com. Get yourself some awesome merch, maybe a skateboard deck, maybe a... can we bring bucket hats back? Let's do bucket hats. Everyone go get a bucket hat. And if you do, let me know. And let me know that uh, you save 20% by using podcast 24 at checkout. All right. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Outer Zone, the official podcast of Formula Drift. My name is Jacob Gettens, and we finally have Adam LZ on. I'm not, I'm not saying that for you. Just people have been bugging me since like day one, dude. It was like the show got announced, like, when's Adam coming on? I'm like, okay, we'll get there. So it's gotta, it's gotta feel good to be popular, right? <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, man. I know, uh, obviously, you are probably top three busiest guys in drifting. Uh, I honestly, <laughs> I want to understand your time management, like of, of from like business person to business person. Like, how are you juggling everything? Is there software that you're working with? Do you like time block? Is there a strategy? Um, I've gotten better. Uh, I, w- I would say if you asked me this about a year ago, I would be like, well, you know, the low hanging fruit just gets dropped and that's how I manage it. But lately, um, I've, I've done a lot better job at managing stuff. I brought on an executive assistant about a year ago and that's helped me tremendously just being able to stay on top of the really important stuff. Um, but other than that, just, uh, you know, using my calendar really leading to that's helped a lot. Yeah. And it, it's, it's interesting, like in research, I realized that your awareness of time management has gone back like almost since day one, uh, kind of uh, around the million mark, you know, you were still in school at that point in time. It feels like that's when you kind of realized how serious you needed to take it. Um, so I, I'd just be curious, like how that's evolved since then you said like the low hanging fruit drops, but like, is there anything that you realize quickly, like, oh, I have to stop doing this or start doing that to to make sure I can fit everything in? I feel like it all started in um, uh, microeconomics. Okay. I took microeconomics and it almost ruined me <laughs> because it starts making you think of every single opportunity cost. And when you start realizing the opportunity cost of where you spend your time, it's really hard to rationalize doing fun things. So <laughs> I'd say... Now, um, what I've done before, every every single thing, it was like time was just like burning a hole in my pocket if I was doing anything that wasn't productive or building my brand or building my business, where now I've put a much higher value on like uh, personal stuff that has like, I guess, uh, unwritten value. Um, I feel like I didn't really answer your question, no, but I feel like it was on the same it's topic. All, it's all good. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting though, because yeah. like I am, I feel like this with a, with a lot of people, like where I instantly feel guilty for taking any time away from progression. And it sounds like you've kind of gotten past that hurdle where you're like, whoa, like you can, you still need to progress, but you can't have that at the cost of everything else because it'll catch up eventually. Yeah, you'll get burned out. I think it's crazy how like reduced I'll feel after just going out to dinner with a friend or spending some time hanging out with the dogs with Colette Mm -hmm. or just like the little things that don't and shouldn't impact your business actually end up impacting your business because it kind of like resets you. Mm. It's like, it just builds up like morale points that you can kind of use during those like slogging meetings and stuff where you're like, kind of build up that like, ah, yeah, it was great. You know, when you're listening to reports or numbers fly through you and it's like, at least I can remember when I was hanging out with the dogs. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. I mean, for me, it's almost just like, you know, if you, if you keep doing the same thing, you'll get kind of like in a rut where it feels like time just blends together, where when you have the fun things, it kind of separates and compartmentalizes the day. So it feels more like a new day. Like last night, I was working till like probably midnight. Yeah. And then I got home, went to bed, woke up, did the same thing again. <laughs> it feels like the day is merged together versus you know a day where you go and do something, I don't know, casual. It, it like creates a separation of start and finish of that mindset. What, what is like, what is it? a general work schedule for you? Obviously, like, it's probably all over the place because it could be like, you know, I got to go film me, you know, unclogging drains and then I'm drifting a GTR in in the snow. Like, 
but but like in I guess like a typical day around the compound, like when you get up, like how do you how do you get things rolling? Yeah, um, I guess it, it kind of depends on the day during the week. So I'll, I'll give you a really high level like week um, recap. Uh, so right now I'm living off site. So there's like an hour, not an hour commute, like half hour commute here. Um, but nine to six is really our business hours. Mm-hmm. We've got like an hour lunch usually around noon. Um, Mondays are pretty much like 60% high level leadership meetings and like 40% catching up on emails and stuff. Um, usually Mike will be editing most of Monday, whatever I filmed over the weekend. And then Tuesday is usually like another I don't want to say like a catch up day, but usually because I wasn't able to film Monday because of all the meetings and stuff, we try to film a full video and upload it on Tuesday. So it's kind of like, uh, it's just stressful. And usually Tuesdays will run a little Turn late. And then Wednesday, we, Wednesday, we get back in the cadence of, okay, now maybe half a day is filming on Wednesday and it's finished up on Thursday and uploaded Thursday. And then Friday sometimes is try to film a whole video. I've kind of taken a step back from trying to do a video every other day. Um, just, uh, it's just a lot to juggle with. And I, not that it's not important to me anymore. It's just I have a lot of other stuff that's more important to me. So I'm kind of just more focusing on quality over quantity. Uh, it's just, the way that YouTube used to be, if you didn't upload every day at once, um, the algorithm would punish you. And then it was every other day. And now uh, it seems like it's a little bit more forgiving if you don't upload that consistently. Are, are you uh, like more or less keeping up on what would be considered like YouTube trends or is it one of those... You have an, an internal barometer at this point in time where you can kind of tell you're like, okay, I think this one's going to do all right, but I'm noticing a trend that like, okay, they're pulling away from this 14 minute mark, pushing more for like a nine to ten. Like, I, I, are you diving into the analytics and reading the data, or are you just kind of going by gut feel at this point? Yeah, I'm definitely like I've got some friends that like really dive hard and they're really well versed in like what's working, what's not. I'm usually the last to find out. <laughs> I, I admittedly don't do as much research as I should. Um, trend-wise, in terms of topics, I usually try to just follow what excites me because I feel like when I'm the most excited about something, it translates and the videos perform the best. Um, and that keeps me not getting burned out on YouTube. I feel like the easiest thing is when people start making videos because they want to achieve a view number, they want to um, get some sort of result, they kind of lose their passion in it. Because the the whole start of YouTube was really just like a, an opportunity for people to express themselves doing what they want and what they like to do. That when it you step away from that, it just kind of becomes a job, and then it's not fun. Yeah, I, I think people get tied to the excitement and and maybe in particular kind of the pass that you took in YouTube, which is uh, based around like honest progression. Um, and and I guess like when you start to chase a number or chase a goal at that point in time, it it translates through the video whether you know it or not. Yeah, it's pretty easy to see when people are making videos and it's just for, uh, I don't know, just because they know it's the thing to do, you know? Yeah, the, the clout or whatever, or, you know, just going through the motions, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's videos you look back yeah. on and you could be like, yeah, like I just did this because I felt like I had to get something up at that point in time. And then there's other ones you go back and be like, no, I, I just enjoyed the hell out of that entire thing. Yeah, for me, the 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 best is when you can have both. So, like, I recently did a, a little like series on um, this legend, which is like an old race car uh, with a street bike yeah. engine, and that was something that, like, selfishly, I was just browsing Facebook Marketplace, and I, like, my impulsiveness was like, I want to do this. It's going to be cool. It's going to be fun. And then when I started thinking about it, I was like, okay, there's an angle where I think I can make some YouTube videos that will do really well too. So when when you've got something that I feel like has viral potential and it's something you're really excited about. That's the best. Mm, okay. So you, like you looked at that and went like my inner self is like, this thing is amazing and awesome. And then you kind of go, okay, business now goes like, okay, like if I did this and this with it, I can have all the fun I want and it'll make for great content. Oh, by the way, it lines up with all these other things. So this, this is going to like one of those, like all the cards laid out perfectly. And you're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. I mean, even if it worked terribly, I knew that people would probably enjoy me tinkering with something different. So yeah. it's cool. To like that, That's one of my favorite things about the YouTube platform is it allows me to chase these side quests and rationalize them and go places that I wouldn't normally go and do things that I wouldn't normally do. Yeah. I like the, I like the rationalization like during the process as well. 
just because like I, we all do it as car people. I mean, anytime I've bought a car or a toy or an upgrade or something like that, I'm rationalizing it as I'm going through the process of either paying for it or researching. I'm like, no, I definitely need this thing, even though, you know, deep down, I probably know I don't. So getting to, I guess, play with that on a much bigger level or a different level, um, it's got to scratch an itch in a very different way. <laughs> I mean, it's cool. Like we just did this project with a Safari GTR and it was something where I genuinely didn't know if it was going to be terrible or if it was going to be good. So having YouTube as a cushion to be able to rationalize that decision to take a chance uh, gave me a little bit more confidence to do something a little more unorthodox. That's fair. Do you, do you ever like go back yeah. to like risk analysis with any of this? Like, like looking at, uh, like you're obviously a very career-minded person uh, I think you have some of the best business sense that that I've seen, especially in drifting. So I, it's it's very difficult for me not to look at any of your decisions to, and go like, oh, this was impulse. Like, I feel like there was at least some meeting either with actual people or just in your head where you, where you went like, okay, this is a good or a bad idea. No, unfortunately, I'd say my biggest strength, my biggest weakness is my, uh, my impulsiveness. Mm-hmm. So... Um, yeah, a lot of times it'll be like the day before a video goes out, it was just a random idea I got and I execute on it. And I think that's part of the reasons why I found success. And a lot of it comes from just being super ADD and just like constantly just changing where I, what I want to do and what I want to focus on. But the the downside to that is I miss out on a lot of business opportunities, specifically with sponsorships and bigger partners, because I don't have the runway when I have an idea or I have a build um, a lot of people, you know, they'll tee up something that they want to do three months from now, and it's really easy to sell that. I can't sell something that I just got an idea for yesterday that I want to execute tomorrow. So, That's a good point. It's a big weakness. Oh, wait, too bad you couldn't just have like a, a like just a slush fund from a brand where you could just work with them and be like, listen, just give me like a couple hundred thousand dollars, and I'm I'll utilize it. Don't worry. I can't tell you how yet, but by the end of the year, the money will be spent, and I'll send you all your data, and you'll be happy. Like that's a, an, a massive amount of trust. I'm sure it happens, but. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's the ideal partnership for me. And I have a few partners that are kind of like that. And those are the ones that will wind up on the cars that uh, are, you know, those last minute decisions. Because whether it's financial or just product, I know that they're down to overnight me parts if I need it for some random idea. Or I know that they're going to support me and they know that I'm going to, whatever dumb idea that I have, it'll probably benefit them in some way. So um those are those are the ideal partnerships. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's an immense amount of trust that a brand has to have, but I think I think at this point you've you've established enough that like that's that's a, a risk that any brand uh, I wouldn't say any brand, but most brands would be willing to take. Like the resume is good, so it's just one of those like you know smile big and say trust me, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, so I I want to understand, you know, you've you've done a lot of extraordinary things. Like, have you? What what moments have made you like take pause to like reflect on all of this? Like whether going, you know, I mean, it's ten years, right? Like realistically, we could compartmentalize this into ten years. It, it, what what are those mm-hmm. moments where you had a chance to stand back and be like, hold, like what is going on right now? There was um, so I, I was actually just in Colorado, and I, I'll say this was a, a pivotal moment, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. But I was on a panel, and I, I was actually asked a really similar question of like. Uh, a real pivotal moment for me. Um, I don't, maybe it wasn't pivotal, but maybe it was just like a, a really big moment in your career, in your profession. And what I actually referenced was, uh, so I'll give a little backstory yeah, to this because it's, it's kind of complicated, <laughs> but it's kind of not. Um, in BMX, I felt like I was always being delegitimized because I was a YouTube kid. There was a lot of animosity towards me because I had figured out a way to make a living that wasn't the traditional professional route. So they would look to delegitimize my skills or the tricks that I did or the videos that I made because I was a YouTube kid and not a professional writer. Um, And I'm a very competitive person that takes a lot of pride in my skills. So that was something that always bothered me. You know, like I, I got over it, right? Like I learned to have thick skin, but in the drift world, it followed a similar, similar path. Um, Obviously, I think the drift world is much more mature. And I think that I received way more open arms than anything when I uh, originally kind of made the transition over to drifting and started learning and going to events and stuff. Um, But a really pivotal moment for me was when I was going to a Super D event um, in Wisconsin. 
And I showed up, I blew up the turbo in my S13 because I ruptured a wastegate line. I wound up renting a, a KA turbo, like 200 horsepower uh, S13 off some kid in the parking lot and won the whole event. And for me, I was able to see all of the same people that had previously been hating on me and talking trash because I was a YouTuber pretty much eat their words and make Facebook posts that same day of like, damn, that Adam kid can drive. And that for me was just like, I feel like the, the tipping point in drifting for me of kind of earning the respect of people that I look up to. Uh, I kind of, um, in this same panel that I was just on, what I kind of referenced is it was all based around winning and what is winning to you. And winning for me is, uh, I guess this was applied more so to my brand, like my clothing brand, LZMFG, but I'll apply it here too. Uh, I want to think what I'm doing is cool. Like I want to be excited and think what I'm doing is cool. I want the people that I look up to to think what I'm doing is cool and be excited about what I'm doing. And then I also want the people around me, so like my team and family, to think what I'm doing is cool. Mm. For me, winning is checking all three of those boxes. And the the people that I look up to component of that is what I think is the most... Um, I call it authenticity because the people in the industry, like specifically in BMX or drifting, they're kind of subcultures. And they're very quick to push out someone that's in it for the wrong reasons and push out someone that's not authentic. So to be able to have the people that have been in the industry forever, like let's say, you know, Forsberg or Vaughn or Turk, like if they're stoked about my driving or they're stoked about the stuff that I'm doing, that is a huge win to me versus I would rather have that than just have like the mass appeal of people that don't know what drifting is. I got to tick all the boxes. Yeah. Well, I, I remember like very early on that that Vaughn was a pretty big advocate and and there was a lot of conversation around that and and obviously that developed into the RTR relationship but i mean especially with something like the comparison between BMX and and drifting is so similar because you have so many multiple ways to be considered professional whether it's that youtube route whether that's the competition route or or just like the party and uh, for lack of a better term show off route but to have somebody like Vaughn become an advocate almost right away, um, I'm I'm sure gave you a bit more ease when you when you started to push into the, a higher competition level. Yeah, I mean, I remember my first uh, my first ever time in Formula Drift. I was at Orlando and I was struggling to keep up on the bank. Just uh, I think I'd never I'd never driven that track before with rubber down. So my setup that worked really well uh, on a loose track was not working. And Vaughn was one of the first people to come over and he was telling me stuff that takes most people years to learn, uh, just little changes and adjustments to make that I still do to this day that a lot of people don't know. But um, he, he definitely was uh, was right in my court all throughout, um, even when I was running my own team. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's a huge accolade to, to have somebody like that, you know, come into the sport. I think, you know, when we talk about, you know, quote unquote, the haters or the or people, you know, however you want to put it, just people who kind of looked in like, oh, can I take this person seriously? Um, I Obviously, St. Louis had to be a, a massive stepping stone at that point in time. But it it sounds like you almost even well before that kind of were like, OK, I, I did what I needed to do now to to shut people up. But then St. Louis comes around and it's like, I don't know if that's like the final stamp where you can be like, OK, you can all stop now. I did the thing I said I was going to do. Like, can we can we all move on at this point? Do you mean E-Town? Sorry, or sorry. did I do no, something in no, St. Louis? No, you're right, E-Town. I okay. apologize. Yes, thank you. I was thinking, I was what, like, like, what am I, I doing like, in St. Louis? I think, I, qual- <laughs> I, think I, I got a good qualifying score once, but I don't think I ever yeah. did well. No, E-Town, thank you. I mean, obviously, there, there was a couple of like incredible moments in Pro 2 as well that like we can go back to that for me personally, like that's when I, on it, like was like, oh, this he's not just somebody here for clout. Like this is somebody who can actually drive. Um, but yes, I, I apologize. I meant eat. Um, thank you. <laughs> I think the biggest thing that people will um, kind of neglect to realize it's kind of what you said right there is for me going into FD made no sense. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I could like, so if anything, it was the, the exact opposite. I would have more clout if I was making viral videos and going and doing the traditional YouTuber thing of exotic cars and getting chased by cops and I don't know, whatever all these YouTuber people do. <laughs> going into professional motorsport, 
requires a lot of time. It's a lot of dedication. And when I did it, it's because I was not fulfilled in what I was doing. I wanted to have some sort of direction. I wanted to have some sort of challenge to work towards. I'd gotten to the point where I would access to go drive whatever track I wanted. I had a FD level car. I had a seat time car. I had a mid-tier car. I could do whatever I want, but it gets boring if you don't really have anything to work towards. Mm -hmm. So FD kind of gave me the platform to push my skills and you know, really build my company to be able to support a program, build my brand to be able to support activating at events. Um, I kind of pushed everyone on the team and gave us all like a common goal to work towards. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's a huge risk, you know, that those, those first years that you came into it because you're, you know, obviously there's sponsor backing, but primarily, you know, you have funding, you have staffing that you're dealing with. The, the time part of it is, is insane and people don't recognize that enough because it's, it's crazy. It's very little of it is the weekend. It's everything that goes around the weekend. But then also, you know, you, you put your ego on the line. You put your, your notability and, and credibility on the line to go and compete with the best. And what, what I think is interesting is you documented it the exact same way that you documented your come up in BMX, as well as just learning how to drift, where you're open and honest with struggles, both mechanically, team, operationally, uh, and, and mentally as well, like to, to try and get to that level. Um, how, how, how difficult is it to be that open with your audience, especially when taking that big of a jump? No, that's a really good question. I would I would say first off, it's very intentional. I knew exactly what I did in BMX and why it worked. And the relatability thing is why I was as successful as I was. I was not the best rider, but people would see me from not knowing how to bunny hop to riding with pros and doing pro level tricks. I I actively searched to do the same exact thing with drifting, and I was very intentional about putting crashes and spin outs and all that. But I would say the biggest challenge is when I don't want to say when politics get involved. <laughs> But whether, whether I'm with a company, with another team, with my own team, a lot of times things will happen, say, with the car or internally. Maybe someone made a mistake on the team or there's an issue with the car that might reflect poorly on a sponsor. It's really challenging when I can't be authentic and I can't say the real reason why what's going on. Mm -hmm. That hurts my ego because I'll end up just taking the ego hit and being like, yeah, you know what? I just didn't drive hard enough or I didn't do this knowing that it was something else, but I can't say it because it would like the, it's way easier to do damage than good on YouTube. Yeah. And you have to be so protective over the people and the companies and the things you have in your video. If I say, I need to think of something fake so I don't I, accidentally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you spin when, out and you're like, Oh, I just, I transitioned too late. Meanwhile, like a, a part that would cause you to spin out had failed and, and that was it. Right. But here's the thing, if I say that, that that part that caused me to spin out is the greatest part ever, it's it people say, okay, cool. And then they th they forget about it. If I say that that part broke and that's the reason why I spun out, people are never going to forget that. And there's some dude who maybe is making that part in his garage and it turns his entire business upside down. He can't feed his family anymore yeah. because this stupid YouTube kid said one bad thing about one part that maybe was my team's fault for installing it. Right. And this is not something that actually happened no, no. by any means. But but it's a that, that's what goes through my head in those scenarios. Because I, I have done the opposite in the past. Like, you know, in, in the BMX world, it was more of a joke than anything. It didn't have any negative implications, but I broke a set of handlebars and made a video yeah. about it and it, it goes viral. You yeah. know? It that's I mean, that's a lot of weight, dude. That's that's a lot. I mean, it's good that you obviously understand the full trickle down of of what you say, what you publish, but like how much are you managing that? Is that like every day? Uh, is it is it you know everything that you say? Not just online, but like in person. Like in the in the position that you're in, like literally one sentence can can change somebody's life, right? Yeah, I mean, in person, I'm a lot. I'll just kind of speak yeah. my mind. I don't really have a filter. <laughs> but in in videos, I kind of I don't say I go into a different mode, but I definitely am very very aware of what I'm saying, how I'm saying it and how it could be taken. And I think for that reason, uh, if, you ever, if you ever see me in someone else's videos compared to my own, it might just seem weird. Mm. And that's because I know that I don't have control over the editing process or how things might be taken or how things might be perceived. Especially if it's someone... I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus, but I have, I have people 
that I've been in videos with before and they just don't have common sense yeah. and they'll put something in a video that creates some real problems. So then when I'm in that person's videos again, I have to be like really hyper aware and I almost can't be myself because I'm like so concerned about what I might say or what I might not say. Where if I'm vlogging, I can always edit it out. I'll say dumb stuff and I'll <laughs> I'll just like I'll just I'll be like, yo, remember not to put that in the video. It's <laughs> just note to editor. I I've done the same thing where you just like you say yeah. it and you kind of like look, you're like, please do not put that in there. And then it's like then 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 end a clip mm-hmm. at that point in time. <laughs> I call it a, I like to refer to it as as YouTuber etiquette. Mm-hmm. And there are definitely people that don't have that. And they will, I think most of the times they just make themselves look bad when there's a situation that happens and they throw someone under the bus or they make a big stink about something and use their platform for, for that reason. I think it just, it's just, it's a really ugly look. Well, it's, it's such a short term gain, right? Like you might, you might gain mm. views or, or a following, you know, very quickly, but it will disappear. There's no rigidity to it. There's no lasting effect to an audience that just comes to you because you shit on somebody else. Right. Yeah, and, and not even like or, it's not necessarily like there's anything to gain. It's like almost like their their ego needs to to hurt someone to feel better. And it, I don't know. It just it's not a good yeah, look. No, that's that's fair. Um, what what's it like going from you know seeing Chelsea Denofa throw back at Pat Takers to then becoming his teammate? Like that's that's such a full circle moment. And uh, yeah. yeah, I. I I can't even comprehend that where it's like that inspiration that sparks this. And the next thing you know, you're like sitting next to him in like, Hey buddy, like, <laughs> I guess we're going to do this thing. <laughs> no, I mean, it's crazy. It's, uh, I want to say that it was never just like a, like, Oh my God, wow. Moment because everything just kind of happened so gradually. But I, I think what's funny is one of the things I look back on is, um, you know, I had even hung out with Chelsea after like he was the person that inspired me. I don't know. I don't, I don't really fanboy over people unless it was like maybe like Drake. Mm. I'm not a big Drake fan, but I feel like he's one of the people that where I would I'd be like, bro, <laughs> no way, that's Drake. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't care to like. I'm not, I, again, I'm not. A yeah, big fan. yeah. Chelsea would hate. Chelsea would hate that I'm saying his name in the same sentence <laughs> as Drake. He hates Drake so much. Drake ruined hip hop. Oh my god. I'm not a. I'm not. I'm not a massive Drake fan. Okay, <laughs> but all right, well, let me get back to the point. Chelsea um, really likes Drake. Right. No, uh, I, I remember just casually being at a shop party in Orlando and Chelsea was talking about his FD team at the time. And I was like, I was still like super beginner. I had like SRS 13 and I would change the tires on my car and that was about it. And he was talking about how he had different um, ratings for torque for his crew, for all the bolts underneath his car and was talking about checking all the bolts on his car. And I'm sitting there like, how is it possible to check all the bolts on a car? <laughs> so many. I'm just like, I'm like mind blown. I'm like, this dude's crazy. He's like, he's really checking every bolt on the car. <laughs> that that can't be necessary. Oh. That is not relevant at all to what you. It's asked all good, me, man. I, I, I wanted to find I, a way. To, I wanted to find a way to throw that in no, there. That's good. I, I like the the uh, the ADD side quest. My wife's got like crazy ADD, and that's that's what we call it. It's just side questing. It's just way off to one side. Yeah. But no, I I I think it's still um, cool though. <laughs> No, I think I think Chelsea is one of the one of the smartest people in drifting, and he has such a different um, such a different thought process and kind of outlook to what makes a car work, what how to get around a track a certain way. And sometimes I disagree with him, but I always learn something from hearing his his thought process and and how he thinks about things. Like it's, I just I've loved being on a team with him because I've just been able to be a sponge and just absorb so much of. Chelsea's ridiculous knowledge base of drifting for I don't even know how long he's been drifting longer than I was born probably. Yeah, he's he's such a juxtaposition in his personality because of how serious he is but how not serious he is, right? Like when you get him mm-hmm. into that that mode where he starts going off and and like gets into it, it's almost like a runaway train, but at the same time like he can be one of the goofiest guys that says the most like ridiculous offhand shit you've ever heard. Um, but he can also be, oh, yeah. you know, businessman too. So like, it's, it's always funny to see him kind of flip through those different things, but his, yeah, his knowledge is, is so much deeper than I think most people know. Um, I'm excited. I mean, I, his new podcast has me absolutely cracking up, like just him, like, especially the, the back and forth with him and Pat just, it just kills me. But, oh, oh man. Yeah. You have to get on there, man. You have to, you got to be the, like the first official guest. 
I haven't uh, I haven't got a chance to listen to any of them yet. But I think Chelsea was the first guest on my podcast, so I, I definitely own. That's them. fair. That's fair. Uh, so, do you think that we will ever get a full length album from the artist known as Doogie? Oh, that's that's been a, a long time gone. Um, all all jokes aside, I still joke that my backup plan is I'll I'll get into music. I don't know what I want to do with it, but I, I like rapping aside, just music in general. No matter what it is, I have such a massive passion for music. I probably spend every minute of my life that I can listening to music from every genre you can imagine. Mm. Um, and I don't know what that will be, but I think like if I if I ever air quotes retired <laughs> from from whatever whatever I'm doing, like music, there's just so many different paths and avenues to go down, and I just I don't know. Music's a really big passion. What do you, what do you like? What are you listening to right now? That's that's got you excited. Like something that's either been on replay or recently discovered. Hmm, that's a good question. So I think when I'm I'm looking at my Spotify, it's all good. It's all good. I got you. Um, <laughs> one one of the the biggest things that I feel like was was for me was originally downloading Spotify because I never had Spotify. I think I listened to Google Play or some lame stuff Damn. like that. Um, and the re- the release re- radar and Discover Weekly on Spotify, I find so many cool random bands that I would never hear, I would never see, and it it takes me down like musical side quests mm. where I'll like wind up in a genre that I've never listened to before. Um, but um, I'd say right now it's like kind of like still like a, a lot of like post hardcore pop punk type okay. music, but there'll be like, I'll get into like some heavy rap stuff just randomly for whatever reason. There'll just be like one artist that's, I'm just like, I don't know why, but I really like this or, or vice versa. Like there'll be a country song mm. that I'll like. And I'm, Colette will look at me like, why are you listening to country right now? I'll be like, I don't know. I just, I just like it. It just sounds good. I've always I've always found like any music that I can I can hear the hard work and passion in, I'm I'm fine with. Like it doesn't matter the genre. Similar, like I I'm much more of a punk and metal, post hardcore, you know, that kind of stuff. That's where mm-hmm. I, I traditionally, you know, trend. But then something will come up that that I can I can feel. Like it'll come on. I can I can just whatever that connection is, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm I'm gonna be listening to all of this now and and similar, just kind of go down that that back road. I, I went on a bluegrass and like outlaw country stint for like a month straight. Sick. Yeah, it was it was awesome. I mean, it, bluegrass if you especially if you like punk, bluegrass is just punk with different instruments. Same time signature. It's all about you know like interesting. Don't, yeah, it's it's very similar mentality, same speed, a um, little more upbeat. That's about it though. Yeah, it is nice like to listen to happy music for a change. I feel like when you when you get stuck in like the sad boy hardcore yeah. like even like emo rap genre, it's I don't want to say it like affects your mood, but it definitely like then you listen to happy song, you're like, whoa, I feel so good after listening to this. Yeah. But I think I think sad sad music of, will just naturally always evoke more emotion than happy music. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think it's easy, I think it's just an easier emotion to go down, right? It's so much easier to go sad and dark than it is to to go happy. Happy requires a lot of energy and resources, whereas sad requires a lack thereof. So like you can default to sad yeah. real quick. It's very hard to default to happy. You ever find when you have a band that you really like and then they're not sad anymore and you don't like their music anymore? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of like... <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's so messed up to say. <laughs> but like, I feel like a good example of it is Movement, one of my all-time favorite okay. bands. But then like, I feel like they, they just weren't... They're just not sad anymore. They're happy and content in life. So the music just doesn't hit the same. You know? I, uh, it's, it's funny you say that. Which is like, I, I, I very much like to go from like first song of an artist all the way through and like like literally go on that discovery of of them growing up uh, one of my favorite bands of all time is rise against and i think they have probably the best progression because like they were young and like screw the world black mass and gasoline and then like literally in their latest album they talk about it. they're like we can't do that anymore we're old we can't you know protest anymore we can't be at the front lines but we'll support you if you do. And it's just like, I, I, I get goosebumps thinking about it because it's like, you can hear them get older, but they they lose the angst and gain the wisdom. So it's like, I, I felt like I kind of grew up with them in, in a way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what you just said there and I'm going to connect it back home and tell you that in the weirdest, most uh, embarrassing way, one person I look to inspiration from, not because I like their music, but just because I saw... On the, I saw from the the side view of what they managed to accomplish was Taylor Swift, 
And what I mean by that is, can I say swears yeah, on go here? for it. Yeah, no, no, go for it. That bitch, <laughs> that bitch managed to get little girls that liked her music to continue liking her music all the way through her career and stay obsessed with yeah. her from being 13 years old to being 28 years old. And I think what she did so good is she stayed authentic. And I don't know a lot about her, so I could be just speaking out my ass. But again, this is me just looking from the outside. She stayed authentic to what, whatever was going on in her life. And because she did that, she remained relatable to her audience that was able to grow with her. So I've strived to do that from my early days in BMX videos when predominantly my audience was 12 or 13 through what I do now, speaking a little bit more technical, more about business stuff, even if you compare it to the videos I was making, say, when I was you know, five years ago, just getting into the car scene. So my audience has been able to grow with me. And when I hear that like someone got into my videos learning how to bunny hop bar spin and they're still a fan of the channel, that is the coolest thing ever to me, to be able to retain rather than to just try to... I think it's it's more impactful to try to retain the same fans by just being authentic in yourself. Mm -hmm. Then like, imagine if I still tried to entertain, let's just say 13 to 16 year olds, I would have to be so not myself to do that. And that's where I think a lot of people struggle with YouTube is they pigeonhole themselves into a category. And then at a certain point, it starts becoming unauthentic because it's not what they want to do anymore. But that's, they aren't able to transition or take their audience with yeah. them. What, what I think is hilarious is uh, how full circle that whole statement was simply because <laughs> if you go back to your old videos, there's a video of you at Camp Woodward singing Taylor Swift with a bunch of buddies. So, you know, starting at Camp Woodward, you know, going, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just incredible. You, did some, you, said, you did some digging there, Funny, huh? That's my job. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that my, that, was that on my first channel or is that on my new channel? Uh, I think that's on the new channel. It's like four or five videos in. So it wasn't even like that deep of a dig. Okay. Like I didn't, I didn't have to go far back. All it's right, like got it. somewhere around someone like, you know, getting nutted on, on the, on, on a bar spin or something. And then, you know, uh, yeah, okay. you know, a couple Camp Woodward things, you know, fair yeah. enough. But yeah, I just, I just there's, just there's like four channels. I found, I found a few. I did find some SoundCloud stuff as well. That's, uh, that's how I knew about the rap mm -hmm. name. I mean, it, it was, a. Uh, that's it was funny. a journey. It's it's a tough research though, man. There's a lot of you on the internet. So like to find the good deep stuff is is real difficult. Like, I mean, finding out about uh Bert's water cup, that was a journey. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh man. You know, you know Bert, you, you know Bert still uh works with us. I did right? not know that. Yeah, Bert Bert is our customer sales specialist. That's the and same uh, Bert? just recently Yeah, we were in Colorado and he took some probably I don't want to say probably the most amazing car photos I've ever seen from someone that's not into cars. <laughs> like it, I, I did a, if you go on LZMFG, you can go right now. It won't be rude. And you can go look on Instagram. That photo set that I post, he shot. Like he's super, super talented with photos. He's great with customer service. And it's, it's cool. Like a lot of the dudes are the same dudes that was on the team back in BMX days. Like half the company rides BMX. That's, that's so funny. It's same dude, same bird. That's so crazy. Oh man, I'm gonna comment yeah. like, yeah, "Why I mean, you put your cup, Bert?" <laughs> yeah, and we we were just talking about that over this weekend too. I don't remember how it came up, but um, yeah, no, it's I, funny. For anyone listening to this, just to context. just to fill you in on the, yeah, give you some context. He was a roommate of mine, and he had this one cup that he drank out of every single day, and it was the most like ugly. It was like Bubbaloo's barbecue or something. This giant cup that was always like three quarters filled with water, and it was like it just would magically appear wherever you didn't want it and it would always be everywhere and you'd knock it over and it'd spill water and it just became an ongoing joke. Yeah. I, I, I do love that you've brought so many people with you on your journey. Like finding out that James was a, was a camp counselor for you at Woodward, like that moment it clicked. Cause I was like, I, I, I did, I had no idea where he came from. I'm like, how did you get so qualified yeah. to do this very unique job? And you know, when chatting with him, he's like, I've just always been around, man. That's it. I just, I just had to learn. There was no other choice. So, I think I think it started. He was uh, working on a school project. It was like a an ostrich T shirt. It was like a uh, what's the thing in Chicago? The the bean. Oh yeah. It was yeah. a graphic design project, and it was an ostrich in front of the bean, and he was working on his computer. And I was like, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So I asked him if I could use it for a T shirt. And I want to say that that's like 
where it started. And then he, he started like doing more t-shirt designs for me and it kind of built from there. But yeah, I mean, James is like day one, day one. Yeah. And one of the only human beings outside of Joe Rogan that can rock a fanny pack with nobody questioning it. He's, he's definitely, he's definitely been an OG fanny pack wearing yeah. boy. Yeah. I, I honestly was very jealous because I was like, there's, I see how practical and useful this is. But I can't do it because you yeah. own this space now. Like <laughs> I can't. Yeah. I, I, there, I mean, you want a merch line? I think. I think that's what we need to do. Like a line of James fanny packs. I think you could. I think you could really bring it back around. I see. I, you know. You know what's funny about that? I've tried to do products before like mm-hmm. that that are. I don't want to say trendy because I, I guess fanny packs were trendy for a little while. If I'm, if I won't accept, it won't sell, mm. and I can't wear a fanny pack. So I can't sell a fanny pack. What a, what a stringent set of guidelines for sales. You're like, listen, if I can't get behind it, we're not doing well, it. Well, I've just <laughs> well, I've just seen it. It doesn't work. Like if if I make something and it's something that I wouldn't wear, it's it doesn't get promoted. It just gets pushed on the back burner. Mm. Like, is that is that you just not very, having the passion to kind of like see it through to the end and like push the teams necessary to to get it to completion, or do you think it's just like you don't push it enough in videos or wear it and then? it doesn't gain as much acceptance because like that credibility is not there. I feel like it's maybe a little bit of everything. It's an interesting point. I never really thought about it that way. But I think also too, maybe maybe the people that watch my videos are a lot like me and wearing a fanny pack is weird for them mm. yeah, because they're a, they're a black t-shirt and black jeans post-hardcore <laughs> listening to person and a fanny pack is... Is a little bit adventurous, you know? You got me with the black t-shirt and black pants. I, I posted yesterday. So I'm one of those weirdos where I own, I think now it's nine black t-shirts and nine black pairs of pants. My life is very simple. I know what I'm wearing every day. And I know how crazy it sounds, yep. but it has made my life so much more simple because it's just like that part of my day is already decided and is decided for the rest of the year until I have to like go to FD and then they make me wear a gray t-shirt and I have to accept that. But I don't know. Maybe one day they'll make me one. I've been getting... <laughs> I've been getting wild this year. I've I've purchased a few pairs of jeans that aren't black. Okay. They're different shades of black. Ooh, ooh, go on. <laughs> like, 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 like slightly more gray than black. That's Interesting. that's a huge departure for me. Interesting. That's uh that's a yeah. bold move, Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is. I, I think uh, it's like Alex Martinez made a joke in a video about that. He's like, why is everybody here wearing black? Like everybody in the pits, all the yeah. media people, everybody. <laughs> well, I think there's there's also a, a utility of just not having them get dirty. If I wore like white jeans or even blue jeans, I would thrash them. They would be so yeah. toast. We're like, I'm rolling around in oil and kneeling on the ground and laying down doing snow angels in a concrete parking lot and I get back up and I look yeah. fine. I I I do think that there is a a part of it that comes over from like the cultures that have more or less attracted drifting whether it's like skate, BMX or or moto or anything else like all of those cultures as you said, like as people are growing up, they've kind of realized like my body is deteriorating, deteriorating. I don't know if I got mm-hmm. that one right. I need to find a sport that gives me the same thrill and excitement, but I don't have to worry about my knees blowing out because I, I case the landing. Hundred percent. Yeah, and I think the the similarities with it, you know, the the saying is, with age you get a cage. A lot of people, you know, they get out of the action sports and they get into racing because you know it's a, quite a bit safer. Mm-hmm. But it's also kind of that same uh, subculture feel. You know, the BMX I feel like translates a lot over to cars just from the the modification and technical standpoint of changing parts and angles and this and that to make a bike or a car feel a certain type of way. And also just the like, I don't want to say rejection of authority, but like, you know, drifting to a certain extent is doing what a car is not supposed right. to do. You're, you're trying to like taking a bike and riding it somewhere that you're not supposed to ride your bike. Like it, there's a direct translation to that. Yeah. I, same thing with That's, skateboarding. It, yeah, th- that culture of like taking bikes places they shouldn't go is is always something I was kind of fascinated with. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put myself out here. It's a very vulnerable moment. I grew up as a rollerblader. Uh, I, I haven't wow. in a while. That's cool. It was I I wasn't amazing, but like for some reason in that like screw authority kind of thing, I was like I don't want to BMX. I don't want to skateboard. I don't want a scooter. No offense to those guys because they can pull some crazy shit. I was like oh let's get into rollerblading, but like I never got the like I'm gonna go run these steps and and go out in front of town hall and run that kind of stuff. I don't know why. I was always a park kid, but um yeah, the BMX thing like it's very much into the public riding space. Yeah. 
Yeah, one one thing I struggle with nowadays is when you're when you're younger, you like have this this mentality that like anything that's owned by say a company or business is like I don't want to say free because that's not the mm. right word. Like grinding a handrail outside of a business, I would never have any remorse for when right. I was a kid. It was like oh, it's like it's I don't like I'm just it's, it's just a business. It's yeah. whatever. Where yeah. now I'm on the other side of that, so I'm like I'm like man, I really want to grind this handrail, but like. Some dude worked his ass off and <laughs> built this business and painted this handrail. And I know how much it costs to paint handrails. Do I really want to grind it? Oh, uh, well, someone has already done it, so I guess it'll be okay. <laughs> but if it's a new fresh, but if it's a new fresh painted handrail, I'm just like, oh, I can't be that guy. Yeah. Cause on the other side, I would be so mad. But it's interesting. Like I still literally would ride the same stuff and would want to do it, but I have like this moral conflict now of riding street. Mm. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's such a an age thing like of of understanding the full consequences of any action, right? Like you just it has to come with time. And some people never get it. I mean, we all know, you know, it's similar to what you talked about with some of the YouTubers just like not being conscientious of those around them. Like some people never develop it, but for the majority of us, we're like, "Oh, that's an expensive handrail. I wonder how much that costs to get installed." Like I wonder what that quote was like. I wonder how many quotes he got. I wonder what contractors like. You know, for me, that's that's how my brain spirals when I look at those situations. I'm like, I wonder how many quotes he got for that. Railings handrail. are expensive. Yeah, and like paint, paint is so crazy. Like what it costs to paint a building. Then I think about how many buildings I put rainbow tire marks on. Well, you know, what? actually, it doesn't matter because those would wash right off. So I don't feel guilty about that. <laughs> but still, like it's crazy. Like how much stuff you don't ever think about costs. Yeah, we. We had a, uh, the, the, one of the companies I run, like we had a conversation the other day about meetings and I calculated how much money it costs us for one of these meetings. And I was like, do we want to continue to spend this much money just to have a discussion that two people talk at? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, I could record this and send this to the staff because no one else is talking in this meeting, but this is how much it costs. And like, yeah. I didn't even think about it. I mean, it was, it was a good chunk of change just to have people sit there and listen to me jabber on. And then, you know, now there's people that do it for free and actually wait for it every week, which is very weird to me, but I'm getting used to it. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the first year where I've, I've kind of done a similar thing with uh, events. Mm. Or I should say last year is the same thing where I've done like a full, uh, and my assistant mostly puts them together, but we'll look at an event and we'll see exactly what we're spending in wages, in flights, in accommodations, in food, in uh, let's say vehicle repairs, tires, you name it. And it is, it's honestly made me, I don't say not want to go to stuff, but I'm way more calculated about the stuff I'm, I want to do and the things that I'm not going to do this year, uh, which is a little bit of a bummer because there's a few events that I'd probably like to go to that I just I can't rationalize when I see how much they actually cost. Because when you're in it, you don't realize it and you just kind of like, oh, you know what, food here, yeah. whatever, you know, uh, especially with like payroll and stuff because you don't like payroll happens regardless. You don't think about that. But then when you see it all in front of you, it's like, was it worth yeah. it? Did I have enough fun to, to rationalize spending this much money? Yeah, it, I think. I think it's such a good reflection too, like especially when we get into drift programs and stuff is like, uh, I've had so many conversations with guys trying to get into FD and I'm like, listen, it's not going to be the engine or the chassis or the roll cage that's going to make you go broke. It's going to be the three chi- like trips to Chick-fil-A. It's going to be the gas station stops. Yeah. It's going to be all these things, those nickel and dime small line items that screw you. Yep. Business is the exact same way. Like you account for payroll, you account for like software and hard goods, but it's the... You know, it's the it's the expense of being a cool boss that'll bankrupt a company real quick. Yeah, <laughs> Taco Tuesday will eat through the budget us, quick. Like <laughs> a lot of it for us, I feel like we probably, you know, wasted tens and tens of thousands of dollars just not on booking things soon enough between hotels and flights. Just you wait, you wait an extra month, yeah. and you've now just doubled your cost. Yeah. Yeah, which I think is just, it's crazy. just for anybody listening to get into drifting. Like, if you know you're going to do a season, like, book it now. Like, so many, like, especially with flights yeah. and stuff like that, like, or even, you know, pay, pay the little bit of insurance. Like, if you're really afraid about that, pay the $30 insurance because it's going gonna, it's gonna to save you so much more down the line. So, yeah, it's tough. It's, it's incredibly tough to, to do something like that. And I think for a lot of people getting into drifting, it's one of their biggest ventures that they're ever going to be a part of. So, you know, they may not have the experience to, to, to understand what those costs and what those, you know, business 
minded practices need to be before they before they ever get into it. For sure. It sounds like you're you're you've been in a similar space as well. So I get I get it. Yeah. Look, this last year, 2023, was insane. I actually had to go to the hospital if you knew this, uh, but I had a hand injury uh, just due to the number of high fives I received from everybody that saved a couple bucks by using FD Podcast to check out. And if you want to be one of those people, if you give me a wicked high five, make sure to use the code to check out, little coupon code area. Just put in FD, just the two letters, podcast, and you'll save some money on your tickets. So why not? If you're coming to the event, save some money. Might as well. Sorry, yeah. I wasn't sure. It looked like you were you were typing away. I'm like, oh man, is there a fire? Am I, am I keeping oh, I you back? No, I didn't. Know you, I didn't. I didn't know you could see that. One of my uh, one of my boys just got back from Colorado, and I just wanted to text him saying, "Hey, glad you made it back, but please be quiet. I'm on the podcast." <laughs> I appreciate that. It's for the good of the show. So we're good. We're good. Don't worry yeah. about it. Oh man. So um, uh, I've I've heard rumors that uh, you you have some obscure things that that you like. Um, can you explain to me the rationale behind eating salad without dressing? Um, uh, it probably started with my dad. My dad just never got dressing in salads. So I guess I just, uh, I didn't, um, I didn't ever eat it. So it just got weird to me. Mm. Um, but I, I remember there was, we used to go to the pizza palace in Newtown, Connecticut, and I would just get a bowl of carrots. <laughs> I wouldn't even get lettuce. So like lettuce was the next step. And then, and then came croutons. And then came cheese, okay. and then came onions. Um, I've had, I've had salad dressing once or twice, but I'm just, I just don't like vinegar. I think that's that's where it, uh, where it comes from. I don't like very high vinegar things. I don't like vinegar on chips. I don't like vinegar on salad. I don't like vinegary barbecue sauces. It, have you heard of ranch? <laughs> yeah, I also don't like. Uh, I also don't like. like the- now I'm going to let you say it. I'm, I'm trying to think of how to say this and, and not sound inappropriate. No, I'm just going to let you but do But like it. Cer- certain dairy products <laughs> Damn it. that aren't milk or butter okay. or whipped cream. Yeah, I mean... Like I don't like cream cheese. I don't like mayo. I don't like ranch. Maybe it's a texture thing. I don't know. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, all right. Yeah, I mean, I can't. I can't argue with that. I just... There's like very few signs of someone being an absolute psychopath that I take seriously and a lack of dressing on a salad is, is definitely a red flag for me. It's a good conversation starter. It's, you know, it starts a lot of conversations. Waitresses like to make fun of me. My girlfriend always likes to make fun of me. <laughs> Other adults make fun of me, but I love it. It's like you're eating a fresh thing that just came right out of the ground. You know, you really taste everything. In yeah. That. Okay. All right. I can, I can get behind that. I just, I think I've just had so many cheese is important. Yeah. Without cheese. It, it lacks something. The cheese is important. You just need to have some sort of fat that's on it, you know, to, to cut through the healthiness of the greens. Well, and it's it's tough if if it's a salad that doesn't have a lot of like water in it. Like, you know, when you get like a real healthy salad and it's all the Kale. the lettuce that, yeah, that just like tastes like you're eating licorice. I don't know, the weird, like arugula, yeah. like all that weird stuff. That's tough. Okay. It's tough eating that stuff yeah. dry. Romaine, I if you got like percent, ro- but, yeah. Romaine, yeah. Iceberg's a little too much water for me. I feel like romaine is the sweet spot. Romaine's good. You know, maybe throw a little bit of the weird red lettuce in there and cabbage DQ, and all the yeah. other crap. But the the romaine is the base to have a little bit of moisture to the salad. It's key. <laughs> We're going to have to... I, there's going to be some restaurant now that's going to have just the perfect Adam LZ salad. I, I'm waiting for it. They're, they're going to hear this. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think... I think if you had a salad, like I eat my salad, I think you'd enjoy it. You know, I don't think I don't think anything that I like is bad. I tell people that a lot. When someone's like, "Oh, what should I get at the restaurant?" I'm like, "If I like it, you'll probably like it." That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay, it's all safe stuff. I don't like I don't like anything weird, <laughs> except for maybe Indian food. But I feel like everyone would like Indian food if they just gave it a I, try. I would agree with that. I I do agree with that one. I think I think Indian food is is. I mean, there's a lot of global di- like global cuisines that are slept on, but I think one that's like readily available in almost any city you go to, that's it. But I mean, I'm sure at one point in time, open, like pizza open. was weird, but. I mean, being able to eat Indian and Thai food opened up a lot of doors for me in life. You know, there's a lot more restaurants I can go to, you know, I'm not cycling between the same stuff and it's good, man. Yeah. It's real good. You just got to know what to order. That's fair. I, butter chicken is always a safe yeah. bet. And then you can kind of expand your horizons from there. The more bold you decide to get at that point. 
I'm a I'm a tikka tikka masala guy, which is like the most played out, like generic thing to get in an Indian place. But it's it's gotten me to be tolerant to medium spice, which in Indian is actually pretty spicy. But like I used to be like ketchup is spicy. Ah, so gotcha. Like stay away from salsa kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. If salsa was not like super mild, it was gonna be a problem. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's amazing. I, I mean, I, I, it's good to know that like, you know, if, if by chance we, we go for dinner, that there's so many places that are, are off, off the table, but that's I'm just, I'm setting myself no, up for that. No, we can, we, <laughs> we can go anywhere. The only pro- places I have a problem with, if it's only seafood, I don't eat seafood. Okay. And when places try really, really hard to be like too, too artsy, mm-hmm. I got a problem with it. Like when every single thing has like, uh, I don't know how to say it, foie gras? Foie gras? gras, foie gras. Yeah, foie gras. Yeah. Yeah. When, when every dish has that in it or like mushroom, not even mushroom, but like it's got like truffle and, and foie gras and livers and kidneys and all this weird stuff. I can't, I can't rock with that. Like you just got to have some, some is, there's a steak on there, we're good. <laughs> but like when you try too hard to make things too weird, it, it's too much. So you, you probably don't know this, but I, I worked in fine dining for a number of years. I, I worked as a chef in fine All dining. Right. So like, it's just funny because like cool. I was a direct in like, I mean, that was something that I did for a long time, but it's, it's, it's funny to hear the other side of it because I was always surrounded by people like, we got to make it more ridiculous. We have to go more extreme. We have to add, you know, more complex flavors to it. And, and you're like, it's very rare that I chat with somebody who's like, yeah, no, that's too much. Like, no, no, not doing that. Complex flavors. I like okay. that. I'm down for but like it, exuberance but for the sake it's of just, exuberance. It's the, yeah, it's like when they, when they just like every single thing on the menu has some like weird thing that you don't even know what it is, and you look it up, and it's some sort of like weird fungus right. or like some sea creature that has no business being in this dish, but they just put it in there to like be different. That's fair. That's when I have a problem with it. And some places I feel like they they feel like they need to do that. Where you know what? if you just made a really good grilled cheese and like maybe presented it nicely mm-hmm. and had a really good tomato soup, it'd probably be better than that pile of weird stuff. <laughs> there is something to be said about a really good grilled cheese. So I, I, I'm right there with you on, on that one. I don't think it'll ever be a, a sustainable business venture for me, but I think food is definitely up there as like one of my, even though I, I have like such a like weird palate, probably one of my favorite pastimes is just finding a good new restaurant, going there and just like experiencing mm-hmm. it. But I, I don't think I could ever see myself like doing anything with that in life other than just doing it. Uh, I think it's, I think it's one of those that like, if you truly love it, don't make it your career. Like, and, and I'm not saying that as yeah. like, you know, don't ever do that. But that, that was like uh, something people used to ask me because obviously just being into cars, people like, oh, you should be a mechanic. I'm like, I love it way too much to be a mechanic. Like I, I yep. want to go and enjoy working on a car. I don't want to have to work on a car. Um, is that, I I guess like going back to like the YouTube side of things, like has that ever been something that's in your head where you're like, I really love what I'm doing and it becomes a bit of a struggle because you feel like you have to continue to do it? 100%. And that that kind of ties in with what I said before is I need to be able to be flexible to just do things that are impulsive and things that get me excited because if I'm doing something for ulterior reasons then like if I'm doing something because it's what people expect me to do, or if I'm doing something because it's going to get the most views and make the most money, that's when you start to lose excitement for what that was. Mm. But if you're just doing it because it's the stuff that you want to do, it's a lot easier to not lose that spark. You know, drifting, I've been drifting for a really long time and I still have a massive smile on my face whenever I go drifting. But my drifting decisions aren't guided based on what I think will get the most views. It's based on stuff I want to do. Like going to Abisu after the second time, it's a losing battle going there for views because I'm driving the same tracks <laughs> I've driven now 10 years in a right. row, filming the same exact runs with the same exact people, but I just enjoy it so much. Uh, like, I mean, even last time I was there for like, I don't know, a week and a half. And I think I made like one or maybe like two videos when in the past I'd probably make 10. Mm-hmm. It's, um, but I'm still going to do it because I love it. I'm not going to not do it because it doesn't make sense anymore for the business. Well, I think you're at a place now where you can make that strategic decision of, of enjoyment versus work, right? And I'm sure there has yeah. to be a hard separation of, of those two worlds. Like, I, I, I can't 
I can't comprehend what it's like at your, and I, I don't like using this word, but like at your level of fame or, or influence to like, you know, w- want to go drifting just for the sake of drifting, but also feeling that obligation of like, I'm going to go drifting and there's going to be people there that I maybe feel indebted to because they're fans to, to be able to like spend some time with them. But ultimately I still need this as an escape to, to go and enjoy it. Cause it's still something you love. Like how, how do you balance those two things? Like, do you allocate time? How, like, how does that yeah, work? That's, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll split this up into two. Cause like kind of following the conversation we we're having earlier regarding like YouTube videos, if I go to an event and I know that I'm not filming, it takes so much stress off of me. Cause I just, I usually just end up driving like a, a I guess we could swear. I just drive like a dickhead yeah. the whole time. Like I just, I, I don't care about anything. I just, all I'm focusing on is driving 110% the entire time and just having a good time. So I end up going flying off track, going way too fast, crashing. And that's when I have the most fun drifting. Um, when I'm filming, I'm being more conscious about, okay, well, that GoPro angle. Okay. Well, someone's standing at that corner. Okay. Well, is someone going to get this? What's the storyline for the video? I'm almost like being a director in my head. Um, so like there's, there will be events, whether it's, Japan, I'll just make the decision in a couple of days. I'll just be like, I'm just not going to film today. I'm just going to drive and I'm just going to have fun and just do this because I love it. There's events that I've gone to and done a similar thing. And, um, and then on the fan side, uh, it's just one of those things like, you know, those people are the reason why I'm able to do what I do. Uh, the, the best thing for me is just, is I hate formalizing saying that I'm going to do a meet and okay. greet. But when I don't do that, that's when it's really tough because people want to take every opportunity they can to come and talk to me. Right. And then my anxiety goes through the roof because I'll be trying to fix my car to get back out for the next session. And I'll have four people breathing down my neck, way more than four people, but I'll have people that are just like lingering and hanging where if there's a meet and greet or something, they're like, Hey, come by at the end of the day, I'm going to hang out till whenever and I'll take photos, do whatever. Just, I'm just focusing on the car right now, whether it's at a competition or a fun event, that's definitely helped a lot. Um, just having some sort of time or like designated space to separate the two. Well, it provides them an outlet. It provides you uh, a bit of an out. Like I don't, I don't want anybody listening to this to think that like a, a fan by any means is is a burden or or anything else. It's just you know, and once again, sorry if I'm putting words in your mouth here, but like it, you also have things that you're doing, and to, to find that separation between the two is 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 not easy. I I only really experienced it like this year. I mean, it's somebody who's, um, I guess, recently been in some sort of public eye. Like it was it, it just the past year is the first time I've ever had to deal with anything like that, where I physically had to be on the other side of an FD event. But I also felt guilty because there are a lot of people who wanted to have conversations with me and I really wanted to have those conversations, but I'm like, I got to go. Like, I'm sorry, I got to go. Now, the yeah. upside is I take this hat off. I can walk through that audience and no one has any idea who I am. And it's the best decision I ever made. Ask me again when it's 100 degrees out and I'm still wearing a freaking beanie on my head. But in that moment, it's a, it's an amazing decision. So I like that. <laughs> um, I feel like I feel like we we have tracks in our in our brains, right? Like different tracks of thought or different things. Some people are really good at switching tracks of being able to switch between tasks, switch between, say, emotional conversations and logical conversations. I cannot switch tracks. When I'm in a track, I'm stuck in it. So one thing that's really hard for me, if I'm working on a car or if I'm trying to focus on a run or I'm playing back a video of a run to try to improve in a competition or whatever, and a fan comes up to me and wants to have a casual conversation, my brain will just implode. Mm. I can't switch off to that track. So either... I can, like, I don't want to say I can try to sound rude, but like a lot of times I will end up sounding rude because I literally, like, I can't even think of how to be polite in that scenario because I'm so focused on what I'm doing <laughs> that I'll, I'll, I'll be short, not in a rude way, but just short because I'm not, if I check out from that track that my brain's in, it's really hard for me to get back into it. And that's probably something that I struggle with more than anything, both drifting in the workplace, in meetings, anywhere is I've, I've very much so got a one track brain and, um, it's very easy to get derailed. It's like, it's like managing emotional resources, right? Like if you're, if you're focused in on, on the improvement of a run, all of your emotion needs to kind of go in and at least in my mind, like suppressing the ego of, of like, okay, I need to look at this objectively. 
I have to admit fault and, and problems that, that requires an emotional resource to kind of push that ego down. But then to try and flip to engage that ego to then be like, yes, you are a fan of something I'm doing and I need to be happy about that. Like that's a very, very difficult thing to be able to go through. So it sounds like that being short is almost a kind of a safety mechanism where you're like, if I just, if I only say one or two words, I can't screw this up and I'm not going to say anything dumb. Uh, I, it's just all I have as a resource. Yeah. I think the the best example I can give is like, let's say, I'm trying to think of a good track to use as an example, really any track in FD. <laughs> When you're, in, when you're in line to go to the burnout box, oftentimes there's fans all along the lines of the walls. And that's really your time as a driver to get focused, to start planning your run, to start planning your things. In any other place where I'm in my car and there's tons of people yelling my name, shouting and waving, I'd be have a massive smile on my face, I'd be waving, I'd be shouting things back at them. But in that position, I've got to stay focused. I'm processing what I'm going to do with the car, I'm talking to my team on the microphone, so like it's really difficult in those scenarios to be the person the fans want you to be, but also stay focused on the job you got to do. Mm. Do you, do you kind of kind of reflecting back on like that director mindset? Do you feel like any of that having to swap between competition director, business owner, any of that stuff was was reasoning why like early on you had struggles in FD? I think the. The biggest thing that I've achieved a a breakthrough with this past year and really is something I struggled with my entire life is I was never the guy to go and do something first try. I always baby stepped myself up. I always worked my way up. With BMX, I would would never jump the box jump first try. Mm -hmm. I would always case it halfway, then get a little bit closer, then get a little closer, and then clear it. And that carried over to drifting where like, you know, I would never just go do a perfect lead run, my first run. It would take me 10 runs of working my way closer to the edges, closer to the edges. And in competition, you can't do that. Right. You need to be perfect right off the gate. And if you can't be perfect right off the gate, the other person's going to win. On your lead, on your chase, you have to be able to just snap into that mindset of literally being perfect or you're going to lose. And for whatever reason... um, I'd say this past year, a combination of stuff I've learned from Vaughn, from Chelsea, from driving my E36 and clutch kickers. I can now get in my car, get into that mindset and go do a perfect run when I need to go do a perfect run. Hmm. Where before I could, I, it's not like there was something that was weighing on my mind or I was distracted or whatever. I just, I just could never be the person to go and be perfect first try. Hmm. Like I, I literally made a shirt called 50th Try Adam because <laughs> it was something that was was that synonymous. But at the same time, I embraced it because fuck yeah, I'm the I'm the person that you'll see doing the same trick back to back 50 times until he lands it. Yeah. You know, other dudes try it three times, they give up, and that's why I got good. Interesting. But at the same notion, like it's been really cool. So I've been riding BMX more lately. And I've taken that same mindset from drifting over to it. And in some ways I'm a better rider than I was because I can use that mindset to land tricks that I have no business doing or have no business even trying right now with how little I've ridden in the past couple of years. And I'll go and land them first try, like tricks that used to be like 30th try tricks for me. I'll land first try just because of being able to get to that mental state. So that, that I think is like the biggest breakthrough. And Hmm. I don't know what it was that got me there or how I got there, but it's, it's big. This, this sounds like you need to uh, attempt a flare again. Uh, that's that's what I'm hearing. Is that uh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Just go for it. <laughs> I could I could no, but that's a that's a great example. Yeah. Like that's a trick where it's not hard. It's just all commitment. Mm-hmm. I I 100 could land a flare if I tried one, but there's a little bit more risk reward <laughs> right factor now. that goes into play there. I don't like go. I don't like going upside down. I never mm-hmm. did. Um, my. Uh, my dad runs a uh, disabled water ski organization nonprofit, okay. and we've just we're around so many people that were um, paralyzed or with severe disabilities from being upside down, landing on their neck, and it's just something that was always in the back of my head. So, like flips and going upside down with anything in life always just freaked me out. Yeah, I could I could see how with especially with that background and, and experience that yeah being inverted might might cause a bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But what's what's fun what's funny about it is the fear of being upside down makes you more likely to land on your neck than someone who doesn't have the fear that would just 
complete the rotation. Yeah, it's it's that hesitancy. Like it, it is a full commitment kind of thing, as as you said. Like you have to because if you don't fully commit, that's when you're going to get hurt, right? Same thing in drifting. If you if you fully commit to to doing what you want to do with your car, you'll do way better than if you're hesitant. Well, I think it's. I mean, without getting like too philosophical, I think it. it Approaches so many more subjects as well, where like people don't do something because of that fear, and they 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 don't go all in on it. Like it's not easy. I mean, you going all in on YouTube, you you know, going all in on on any of your business ventures, you have to. You can't like half ass it because if you do, you'll only get that same result out of it, and it's not going to be what you want. And that's you know ultimately why you end up you know either giving up or failing. I mean, you can fail for a number of reasons, but lack of effort is or lack of commitment is is one of the biggest ones. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm going to I'm going to connect all the stuff together again with one of I'll say one of two things that's probably the most impactful thing that I learned in in college that could be applied to driving business whatever and it's the concept of failing faster because the sooner you fail the sooner you'll learn and you'll be able to make improvements. Yeah. <clears throat> so with a business if you're going to talk about it for 3 years while someone else goes out and does it after one month of talking about it, that person now has three years of learning on you because they failed before you did. Same thing with driving. If you go and drive at 100% and realize, okay, the car's too hooked up, you now figure that out instead of taking five laps to drive 100% of your eight laps of practice to realize that, okay, yeah, your setup's probably not good, but you didn't realize until you actually drove as hard as you could. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but I mean, again, it's it's hard to... It's easier said than done, right? Like it's going and throwing your car at a wall and just having the confidence that you're not going to crash. And same thing with business, just going and starting a company, not really knowing what's going to happen. It's scary. Yeah. But I think that's the the best move. That was one thing. And then the other thing um, is the concept of, of lean startup. Mm. And you can apply that, I feel, to a lot of different things in life. Someone has an idea and they think they need to go spend a bajillion dollars and get an LLC and print a thousand t-shirts for their clothing company versus you can literally make one t-shirt, gauge interest on Instagram and have a, a made to order business model and have absolutely zero risk. But people forget that and then they go and take out a loan and they, they again, they, they run themselves into the ground. I mean, again, it's the same thing with drifting. Mm-hmm. Like people will work themselves into debt trying to build a car for FD when they really could have taken their grassroots car to a couple of grassroots competitions and either found out, hey, this isn't for me, or hey, i got a lot more that I need to figure out before I jump into this. Yeah, yeah. I, I could not agree more um, with that. It's, uh, you know, we, it's, it's such a, a common trope in drifting, like overbuilding your car right away. And we've all seen it. I, I have friends now that just got into drifting and they're building, you know, basically full FD cars. I'm like, that is the absolute worst idea because you're going to bin that once and never want to touch it again. Like, yeah. Well, not only that, the maintenance mm-hmm. cost is the biggest thing that people don't look at. The consumables and the maintenance yeah. costs. Like, mm-hmm. you're just going to, once you get over the 400 horsepower mark, unless you have a dog box, you're going to be breaking transmissions. You're going to be going through clutches. And then if you're not working on yourself and you're paying a shop or someone else to do it, you're going to be going way up in the hours. Now you got to make enough power to spin this tire that you're running. So now you're going to be blowing up engines. Now you're going through more fuel. You're using more tires. And it's just like, it's this never-ending scale. Mm-hmm. Thank God we have a tire limitation in FD because if we didn't, the cars would be that much more ridiculous. Okay, so man, you like got right into my next subject right on it. So you're on board with with tire regulations. Just, okay. Yeah, 100%. I mean, what's, what's interesting... Um, I don't want I don't want to turn this into a, a, a drift masters versus formula drift conversation, but it was really interesting to see over there their their tire that they can use over there was so much uh, I don't want to say much more crazy, but just like it's just that much of more of a grippy yeah. tire. It's a different class compared to the tires that we're allowed to use in FD that it in FD if we had that tire. We would have cars with 2,000 horsepower, and it would create a huge, huge gap between teams. Right. In drift, in drift masters, for whatever reason, most of the teams I feel like are operating on similar budgets. That the horsepower is actually the limiting factor. No one that I spoke to there was running under like 22 pounds of tire pressure, mm-hmm. which sounds ridiculous if you talk to anyone in FD because they just don't have the power to be able to do it. 
they don't have, they're not even able to use their chassis setups. Like they're literally running zero toe. They're running like shocks that would not even work at all in FD because the tire is so crazy. Where I like that in FD, we have a, a tire that really has forced teams to kind of develop cars and develop stuff a lot more. Um, but I also like I, both are good. I don't want to yeah, turn this into yeah. a, a weighing thing, but it's just it's interesting to see both sides. But I think if we had the tires that they have over there, because I, I think also just in a, in America, like high end fuels are more accessible over there. It's really hard to get good fuels. It's a lot more expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, engine building here, especially with like the LS engine, like it would be so easy for teams to be having fifteen hundred, two thousand horsepower. I mean, they make it work in other motorsports, so they can make it work in FD, and. Um, yeah, over there, I mean, it's just like most people, I feel like they make like 700 to 1,000 horsepower max, and um, that's their limiting factor. It, it is interesting. Like, I I very much honestly shy away from the, like, the debate between the two series because I don't, I, I'm, I'm happy to like discuss it, but like to like pull any mm-hmm. favoritism, I, I look at it in the exact same way that I look at FD versus grassroots versus FD Japan or any of it. Like, they all need to exist together in order for us to develop the sport as a whole. Like the, the moment we homologate everything into one set of rules and one set of regulations is when it gets boring to me. Like that's why we always talk about it. Like drifting is exciting because when are you going to see this chassis versus that chassis and this engine versus that? Similar, like when are you going to see the, you know, the cars that are built in Europe versus the ones in the US? Like, we all want it. We all want that crossover to happen, but I don't know if it'll be as exciting as what people think. I think it's more exciting to talk about it and theorize about it than to be proven what's actually going to happen. That was one thing that was really cool over there. I feel like because the horsepower threshold is a little lower, you saw like way more variance in engines. And it was really cool that all these teams could like figure out how to make an engine package around a uh, I don't remember if it was a, a turbo or a supercharged Dodge NASCAR right. motor in one of the cars. Um, then there's a guy with a, a diesel engine. There's guys with these engines you've never even heard of. There's RBs, there's JZs, there's V8s from cars that you would never think had V8s. Yeah. And all of them are like making them work and keeping them together and driving within feet of each other on track. Mm-hmm. Like that, I think, is one of the coolest things. It, it really bums me out when I go to drifting and I only hear LS engines. Not because I, I hate LS <laughs> engines, but I just think that's one of the coolest things of drifting um, is that there's so many different paths to go and there's so many different ways to make it work. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I guess, at the, the crux of the, like the whole sport, right? Like that's why we mm-hmm. all enjoyed it is because it allows for that, you know, almost similar b- back to BMX. Like not everybody's riding the same bike. Not everyone has the same style. Yeah. Whatever, seats, handlebars, peg placement, whatever. But at the end of the day, there are certain sets of tricks that almost everybody can do no matter what they're riding. Drifting is similar. You might go about that trick in a different way or run that track in a different line because of your your build. But ultimately, all of these things can still happen no matter what you're, you're controlling. Um, that, yeah. If I... If I went to a drift event and it was all LS S14s that sounded exactly the same, tell me that wouldn't be like the most boring thing to watch. Uh, I mean, I would, I would argue, I would. Part of me wants to see a fully homologated series to truly understand the best driver, right? Like, sure, right? sure. So let's let's remove that. <laughs> let's remove the the level of driving from it and let's look at it as a spectacle. Right. I feel like that would that would like you, the noises all sound the yeah. same. They blend together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I agree. I agree from that from that isolated variable. And I'm yeah. not saying I'm not saying that all LSs sound bad. You can make them sound cool, and some of them do sound cool. And um, but just like you know that generic, just not fun sound. Yeah, yeah. I I I get what you're saying. I think it only. I mean, I think we're jaded to LSs now. That like you know. F- Six, seven years ago, it was it was probably more exciting. And I mean, here's the thing: <clears throat> if the if the Mustang engine becomes the meta and drifting, three, four years down the road, I'm like, oh, I'm so tired of just hearing Mustangs all the time. Whereas, like, you know, it's just it's what you get. Used I wish to. I wish they I wish they weren't so wide. It is insane <laughs> how inefficient how inefficient a single cam LS is. And like how much better an LS engine could be, but it's just literally so tried and true at this point that it's like the thing to go to. But like you're, 
it, it boggles my mind because I try to get behind the LS train and then I like start start building out like what it would cost and what it would look like to mm-hmm. make an all motor LS or like a nitrous LS. And then I realized how small the power band is and I'm just like, this is stupid. You know? Yeah. Like you can you can have a wider power band with a turbo Jay Z. And I think it's a, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna trigger a lot of people. I should probably shut my mouth because <laughs> I don't know enough about LS engines. But you know, you got you got one single cam in the middle. It's not even variable. So you, you gotta really pick where you want your power. Yeah, I think I, I think it, what it does though is like right now, like using the term meta, which I, I obviously kind of like pull from more of the gaming industry. Uh, for mm-hmm. anybody who doesn't know, I, I feel like everybody would know. It basically means like this is the path you go down to be most likely to win. And I think the track yeah. layouts that we run, the judging criteria and the rule book basically have dictated that the LS is the most viable option, your best bang for buck. There was a while, 100%. there was a while where Jay-Z's were it. Right there, there was a point in time in drifting history where Jay Z's were it, but now we've gotten to this point where you have so many micro corrections in drifting that even the the significantly reduced turbo lag that we see in Jay Z's and drifting now is still too much turbo lag to be at the point of that competition. Now, argument James Dean, obviously Piotr Vincek, there are lots of drivers that have been able to get around that, but it is so difficult, and your level of driving has to be at such a high level. To, to, to get around even that, what, you know, a half a second, quarter of a second, few milliseconds of turbo lag that you might experience in it. Whereas in a big LS or a big V8, you don't have that. You can make those micro adjustments and the judges are probably not going to see the majority of them. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to redeem myself for some of the, maybe I'm not going to redeem know. myself for some of the V8 people okay. out there. I think it's harder to drive. Uh, NA or even a, a, a nitrous all motor V8 than it is to drive a turbo six cylinder. I think a super, supercharged LS or turbocharged LS that will, those are easier to drive. Okay. But I think you almost need to drive a NA or a nitrous V8 like a turbo car, but you don't get the torque kit that you would from a turbo. And that torque kit is so important in drifting to be able to light the wheels up. Your torque just is usually going to be like flat. Mm. That's interesting. Okay. I, I mean... So you've got to make more, more power to have the same torque. I mean, I've, I got to drive one of the most baddest V8 nitrous cars in drifting. Yeah. In the Mustang. And it's sick. But at the same time, the power band is like kind of the same as if I had a, a turbo motor the, the same size. Sure, the resolution's a little bit better, but like a good a good turbo six cylinder is, I think, easier to drive. I mean, the asterisk I would put on that statement is that the without going into like too much proprietary knowledge, like it, it's got it's got to be at least three point four liters or yeah. bigger. I'll put yeah, that okay, out there. Okay, I'll, that's I'll fair. give you that. That's fair. Where, where, where are we? Uh, you can, you can, you can. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. You can make it happen with a. You can make it happen with a three liter, but the problem is when you need to make a thousand plus horsepower right. on a three liter, then it, then the, the turbo technology is great, but I've yet to find a thousand horsepower turbo that, nine hundred horsepower turbo, sure, thousand horsepower turbo that will surpass a nitrous V eight, maybe not. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm willing to accept that. Uh, where my caveat comes in. But once you're like 3.4 liters or bigger, <laughs> especially like that, that I can't imagine how much, how ridiculous uh, a VR must feel for drifting. Yeah. It's literally like, I, I don't even know it, what, what displacement is, um, is Forsberg running. It's not a 3.8. I imagine it's got to be a, a stroke, right? Be, yeah. I'm almost positive it's built out. Yeah. So, I mean, his displacement on that turbo engine is probably almost as big as some of the LSs. Okay. I, Okay, so sorry. Go, going back to this caveat, because I feel like this caveat is very important. The car that you were driving sure. in those Mustangs has probably some of the most complex and and radical dynamic suspension we've seen in drifting. Period. Um, I don't have proprietary knowledge of how RTR is doing it. I'm not asking you to divulge any of that, but just watching how those cars react both on and off throttle tells me that you could take that same power plant, change that rear end, and that car would be significantly easier to drive, but wouldn't be nearly as fast. That's that's my take on it. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the the simplest way to put it is like they have some of the most intelligent people in motorsports 
given a task to make these cars do things to be competitive with other cars. And I don't want to say unlimited resources, but like being in Charlotte, being around people in NASCAR, having access to whatever your heart can imagine, we're able to do some really crazy stuff with those cars yeah. to, to make them competitive, to make them do what we want them to do. And as with anything, there's, there's trade-offs. So, you know, no matter what the chassis is, if you want to make the car faster, it's probably going to be a little bit harder to drive somewhere. So it's, it's really just, you know, it's all, it's all trade-offs. But I feel like one important thing to, to note is like, depending on what level you're at, and even, even if we're talking about an RTR Mustang, driving that car, I'm not going to put tire pressures out there. Either, <laughs> so I, don't, I don't know if I'm, but like driving that car, let's say at eight, eight PSI versus driving that car at 12 PSI, it's like night and day. So, and even as it applies to setups, like setups change so much too that it can completely change how a car drives. I don't know. I, I don't really know where I was I, going with that. I, I'm lucky enough to have driven a lot of different cars and I love just like, everyone drives their cars so differently. It's so cool. I don't think most fans are aware of the incrementality of an FD car. That like, like you said, within four PSI, they're two very different vehicles. Within... 10 degrees of track temperature. They are, they are very different vehicles. And, and I wish we could, I wish, I wish we could be more public with that information to, to truly have people understand it. I think there's only a very, very core group of, of audience that would truly appreciate it, which is the tough part. Just because like the audience, like, yeah. you know, you get into NASCAR, I mean, a great example, or NASCAR, Formula One, whatever you want to go to, whatever sport, the bigger the sport, if only 2% of that audience is really interested in the technical details, well, that's, that's uh, I mean, that, that growth is, is super linear. So FD is only so big. So that group of people that would very much want to know the difference between an 8 and a 12 PSI car is much smaller. So like the actual market value isn't there personally. But I do think that like, speaking totally on marketing terms, the retention value of that core group of, of people would be absolutely insane. And I know I threw around a whole yeah. bunch of marketing terms and a bunch of people are like, I, I'm not quite sure where you're going with this. But it's such a niche audience that I bet you if you were to put out a technical video like that, it might only get 2,000 views, but the retention would be like 85 to 90%. I feel like Chelsea's covered some stuff like that. And I've like i I've, I've gotten into it to a certain extent. Yeah. But if anyone's listening to this, I feel like the my go-to comparison for people is, let's say any any given track, let's say you've got I don't know, maybe a 30 degree difference between daytime and nighttime. If you leave your setup the same and you don't make any changes, and obviously, you know, we all grip up our cars more as you go through competition mm -hmm. and you get into finals. If you left everything the same and your car was already, I, I call it maxed out before, like your, your car is at the point where you could not add any more grip or it would not be possible to put the car where it needs to be. You probably need 20% more power from daytime to nighttime. So in a thousand horsepower car, you probably need another 200 horsepower at night if you're not going to loosen up the car mm -hmm. at all, which is crazy to think that the same exact car and the same exact track needs another 200 horsepower to do the same thing that you were doing during the day if your car was at yeah. its limit. And, and arguably 20% slower, right? Like, like you, one, I don't know mm -hmm. if the car would actually make it around the, the track at that point. I mean, there's, there's plenty of different variables in there, but like the car would be, would be so different. Like I, I, I wish people could understand... I, I guess the best comparison I could say is like the difference between like a dry track and a damp track. Maybe not a full wet track, but like if you're used to local drifting with like a 300 horsepower car, um, from my perspective, once again, I'm not an FD driver. I'm not even a great drifter. Um, it is the difference between a full dry track and one that is, you know, either very humid um, and just and just slightly slippery. That That is the difference between the two. <clears throat> Well, I think also too the the other big elephant in the room is rubber on the track. Like think yeah. about watching a car go through Long Beach on Media Day with no rubber on the track and all the natural oils from it being a parking lot. The cars have to be twice as fast after there's rubber on the racing line. <clears throat> like it is it's ridiculous. I mean it's to the point where Media Day almost isn't even valuable practice because the track is so different than what it actually is during competition. Well, we, we see it in practice strategy where guys just won't go out yeah. until the track's been rubbered in, right? I mean, it's, it's, I, I wish we aired practice more because like I, it, there's so much strategy in practice that no one gets to see. It's wild. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to see 
I want fans to become more knowledgeable, like uh, with this podcast in particular, like it's always my goal to have people leave understanding either something more from the, like about the driver, about FD, about the personal lives, and then like the technical aspects. So I, I want, I want more people to get obsessed with it to, to the level I'm at or, or the level that, I mean, there's people who are far more obsessed than I am. Um, but that's, that's how you build a dedicated fan base that's going to interact more, right? The more you let out, yeah. the more you allow, whether you're vulnerable with personal or data or whatever, the more vulnerability you expose, the more invested people get into whatever that thing is. So, which is, you know, For circling sure. back around is, is what I've always found interesting about your videos. And I think it's something that a lot of FD drivers creating content could probably learn from is, is a little bit of that vulnerability. Um, I think, I think they just, they would get more views or more content. Like it's very easy to be stale and, and very businessy, uh, but that's only going to get you so far. Yeah. It's, it's challenging though. I mean, a lot of people, again, you know, they've got sponsorships or partners where they can't say what they want to say mm -hmm. or they can't be vulnerable because it could look bad on them. Yeah. I think, I think there's ways that you can do it though. It's just, you have to be cognizant of it and maybe a little strategic about how you you want to be vulnerable. I think the easiest one is like, you know, everyone's like, oh, everyone comes to my page to like see my car. It's like, post up about what you're doing during the day. Like I, I've had this conversation with drivers all the time. I'm like, you guys live extraordinary lives, but they're so mundane. And and that mundane part is the relatable part that people will hook onto. It's like, oh, no one wants to see yep. like my flight. And it's like, people want to see your adventure. Don't worry about what the actual thing is is it's just people want to see you and what your life is like because they don't get to live it that's that's it at the end of the day they don't yeah. get to live it but cool um i know we're uh we're edging near some time i feel like i would be amiss to see if i can probe you for any questions for for next year is there is there anything you can divulge anything we can get into or is that uh that full lock and key at this point uh, uh i wouldn't say it's lock and key there's definitely um some stuff on the table that just like Got to kind of announce in the right order and in the right right fashion. Um, you know, there's there's definitely been inklings, and I've said things, and people have figured out things of you know what's going on for next year. Um, but hopefully, I'll be able to have some sort of like formal announcement by the end of the month. Just kind of, I got to make sure I roll it out the right way, and not you know two hours into a podcast, <laughs> not really thinking it through properly. <laughs> you know? uh, I tried. I tried. <laughs> but no, that's good. I mean, I, I, dude, I, I totally get it. I mean, hey, if you want to have another episode in a couple of weeks, you just, you just hit me up. You got my number now. We'll make it happen. I, I'll make some time for you. I think I can. <laughs> sure, it's all good. I mean, yeah. I'm down. No, I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what you do. I, I'm, uh, admittedly, I'm not like the guy that's watching all the videos and has followed your career since the beginning. I, I very much have. Uh, been in a, in a position where all that I I know of you has come from from FD and then the odd video here and there that has like a solid thumbnail and clickbaity title. That's about it. But I I'm happy that that's the case because it still allows me as a fan of drifting in general to 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 get to know you and get to learn more about you, which has been kind of cool. Because um, I appreciate yeah, it. No, dude, it's, it's been good. I mean, I think you are far more human than a lot of people know. Um, yeah, I, I think, I, I guess that's the best way to put it is like, you're still a dude at the end of the day. I appreciate yeah. it. Nah, no worries. I just, I don't know. I'm still, I'm still, I still act like a child most of the time. I just try to not act like a child when I, when I have to not act like a child. That's fair. I, growing up sucks, man. It's like the biggest <laughs> trap ever. Like if you have an option not to grow up, don't do it. It's not worth it. <laughs> I found that I, I have the most fun when I'm surrounded by people that are the grown ups. Mm. And when I have to be the grown up, I don't have fun. So like when I'm when I'm around like you know James, James has real dad energy, so when we go oh, somewhere, yeah. like you know, I know that like he'll know where to get the rental car, he'll know you know when when we got to be at the track. So I just have fun and I just care about whatever I want to care about at that moment in time. Where if I'm if it's my show and and I'm the I'm the adult and I'm the one that's run not when I say adult, I use the term mm. loosely, but really the person who is uh, responsible and the person who is planning and coordinating things, it's way harder to have fun and just like not care about stuff. It's a, uh, it's definitely a big struggle. I mean, I don't manage a ton of people. I, I over, I mean, over 10, I'll say, I, I won't get into like details, but like 
having that still be kind of like a relatable and cool and approachable boss, but then also being like, sometimes I actually have to do work and we have to do business things now. And then I have to not be that cool and approachable boss. It's, it's tough, man. It's such a struggle. Like how do I guess like, how do you perceive yourself as a, as a boss? So this, this, this is, this answer is kind of related to what you said, but it's also kind of like another side railed thought. Um, one of the biggest changes that I've made in the past year that has helped me a lot with this exact topic, I've always been under the, the path of um, screw organizations, we want to be cool, laid back company, and that's what's fun, so we could have fun and make YouTube videos, blah, blah, blah. The problem is, as, as things get to a certain size, right? Like we're, we're over 30 employees here full time at the compound, and I'd say probably around like, the 15 mark, if you're that laid back and cool, it actually has the opposite effect. Mm. And it makes work really not fun because there's no real clear organization or leadership or structure. So um, one of the biggest changes I made is I I took a CEO like coaching class um, and hired a business coach to kind of help me put more structure in everything. So now I'm able to have the conversations with my leadership team and I can be myself without having to um, worry about managing tons of people and they manage everyone right. because there's actually management structure now instead of it being a casual laid back, we all kind of work together, kumbaya, it's, there's a clear like, okay, I know that I need to ask this payroll question to my boss instead of me just wanting to screw around and drift in the parking lot with my friend and then a conversation like that coming up. It, it's created like layers that have allowed me to still have fun, be cool and be friendly with everyone without having to also be their boss because I've got a management team for that. Yeah, you can you can provide a bit of separation too between between that, right? Like it's not that you're going to like tell somebody to do something that you wouldn't do yourself, but like having that separation between yourself and, and a frontline employee or a you know, an entry level employee allows you to still have that conversation and kind of like be that boss because there's somebody in between that more than likely will have those hard conversations. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even easy stuff too. Like it's just, you know, I'm so busy. Imagine you have like a question about like, I don't know, a a payroll question or a holiday question. And I'm the person you got to go ask. I'm probably busy filming a YouTube video or doing this or that and you're not going to ask me because you don't want to be busy and then you don't talk about it and it creates some animosity, blah, blah, right. blah. I'm not saying that this is this has happened, but like just as an example of um, how how much of an impact it's made just being able to have like an amazing management team. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I've been in those situations. I'm, I mean, I've been in those situations even this week. So like, I, I get it. But no, it's good. I mean, that's the hardest part is finding... Um, finding the people that you can trust with that and to make the decisions on your behalf and and also understanding that they're not going to make every decision perfect every time. Like that's that's always the the tough one because you're like you have to accept For that sure. people are fallible. Like it's there's going to be things that happen where you're like I would not have done that and then you have to realize well I can't do everything. Someone else has to do that and that's their decision and they get to deal with it. <laughs> so yeah. You get past that hurdle, and then it gets to the point where your management team knows way more than you know, and it's such a cool feeling to be able to just lean on them and be like, like sometimes someone will ask me a question, I'll be like, I don't know, you know way more about that than yeah, I do, yeah. and it's it's true. Like, I, it gets to a point where like your your team becomes the experts, yeah. and you lean on them more than they lean on you. I think I think to circle that back down to like to, to drifting and stuff too, like anybody who's building a team in general, like if you're, if you're looking to compete at a high level, you need to accept that. Like you need to bring on people that know more than you and accept the fact that like they know more than you and you need to trust in that. So I've I've seen it. I've seen it with teams personally where they're like, I brought in this guy to deal with this one thing and my, my driving changed completely because they knew more than I did about one thing and that's it. So yeah. Sick dude. Um, anything else to wrap up? This was, this has been awesome. I'm, I'm glad we got to do this. Yeah, it's cool. A lot of a lot of sidebar conversations. Um, <laughs> I mean, nothing, nothing really on on my mind. Anything on your mind? No, I'm just I'm excited to see what happens next year. Um, 
I got to try and find some time in Florida to, to come and see the facility. I'm just going to invite myself over. I feel like I know enough people that work yeah, there now through. that like wouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, but yeah, dude, I, like I said, thanks for setting aside some time. I, uh, for anybody listening, this was booked like months in advance. That's how busy Adam is. Like, I think we scheduled this in like October. So, <laughs> well, and, and I almost rescheduled on you because I was like, man, I really want to talk about what I'm doing this year, but like, I can't, I, 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 I don't think I'm going to be able to talk about it in this. So I'm like, but it's okay. It gives us an excuse yeah, to do it again. exactly. I've got a question for yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. Mr. Chef. Okay. What are you having, what are you having for dinner? So I already had dinner, um, but we're good. I, uh, so I am back on a, uh, I, I've, I've normally eat keto. Uh, I've, I've normally, I've eaten keto okay. for probably five or six years. I used to be like 270 pounds. Like I was a big boy. Um, yeah. Wow. So I've, I've got all like the loose skin and stuff. I won't freak everybody out, but um, so I'm back on that after the holidays. So I had a really nice set of like pan seared pork chops. Um, that that's kind of pan just pan, Yeah. Yeah. I mean the big trick, like pan, like searing any meat. You cook it yourself. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. So my wife's a, what, I mean, she's not wow. anymore. She works with me now, but she was a pastry chef. That's how her and I met was in kitchens. Sick. So between the two of us, man, it's very difficult to keep the weight off because she'll just be like, I, I, I'm, I just feel creative today. I'm going to make like, you know, a hundred cupcakes and just give them to my friends for fun. And I'm like, oh, but I have to taste them. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to eat yeah. sugar. So, um, yeah, but, uh, it was Brussels sprouts. I love fried Brussels sprouts. It's like my jam. Uh, if there's any vegetable, not even vegetable, like just of all the foods, a good fried Brussels sprout, oh, it's magical. And then, uh, Interesting. yeah, some pork I need chops. to try it. Yeah. You do. You want cooking, you want cooking Pretty help. Cool. Just, just hit me up. I'm happy to. There's so many, so many drivers now that I've sent recipes to. <laughs> I love that. No, Colette and I are the exact opposite, but it's more like a time-based thing. Like it's rare that we have enough time to to eat, let alone cook something. So, but we've got a our house is getting renovated and we're gonna have this big, beautiful kitchen. So we're gonna have to learn. Yeah, I uh, dude, I'm 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 happy to. One of my favorite things to do is to go to other people's houses and cook for them. Cause I don't know the kitchen. I don't know what they have. Uh, I've I thought it is like a whole business idea of just like coming over to people's houses, like go grab whatever food you want and I'll figure out what, what to do with it. And we'll just hang out and Sick. chat and have drinks. Like, I don't know. I think it'd be kind of a cool business. So is, is will people be able to comment on this? Uh, yeah. On YouTube is on YouTube. Okay. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to pitch my idea for you. And if enough people like the idea, you're going to have to do it. Right. So you're going to take this podcast okay. and it's going to be a traveling cook and talk okay. at the driver's house where you cook them a meal and have a conversation while you're cooking. There is a there is a show kind of like this with Bert Kreischer, but I'm a hundred percent down. Um, I'm I'm right there with it. We, I I, I want to do more podcasts like in weird c- scenarios. We did one with Travis Reeder while he was driving in Utah. Uh, I don't know if that's even aired yet, but I asked him questions while he was driving, and it was one of the funniest things I've ever done. I love it. So yeah, I agree. I'm down. Yeah, I'm down. If people if people want to see that, um, we'll just set up lav mics, wireless mics, and just like hang out, shoot the shit. I'll make dinner, and I'm I'm yeah, I'm here for it. So sweet, cool. Well, Adam, uh, thanks again uh, for everybody listening and or watching. Uh, if you haven't yet, make sure to follow Adam. Sounds like there's some big ass news on the horizon, which is going to be awesome. And uh, yeah, dude, thanks again for doing this, and um, hopefully I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Sounds great, man. Thank Thank you. you.